hallway of Site-22. Screams are the only thing that escape each room. A team of men in all-black combat gear and masks move from one section of the complex to the next. Pietro Wilson hides in his office, listening to the cries for mercy of his colleagues. He shakes uncontrollably with fear. Who are they? He thinks. Why are they killing everyone? And how did they find us? Moments earlier, Pietro Wilson had been in the canteen eating dinner with other staff members. A group of heavily armed men entered the room. They stood silently surveying the area. One of the scientists stood up and asked if they could assist them. That's when the carnage started. One of the masked men raised his rifle and shot the scientist in the head. Chaos broke out as the other mercenaries raised their weapons and began firing. Bullets flew everywhere, and Pietro was lucky not to be struck or trampled as he escaped out the back door of the cafeteria. He ran to his office, slammed the door shut, and hid under his desk. Now he sits on the floor, with his legs pulled up to his chest, shaking uncontrollably. After a couple of minutes, he manages to take a deep breath and slows his heart rate. He regains control of his body, but is still filled with fear and adrenaline. Pietro crawls on his belly to his office door. He reaches up and pulls down on the handle. There's a slight click as the latch releases. He opens the door just a crack and peers out into the hallway. The flickering emergency lights illuminate the corridor for a few seconds at a time before plunging it back into darkness. There is no one in sight, but from around the corner, flashes of light from machine gun fire flickers down the hall. The screams of the workers at Site-22 are silenced. Pietro takes a deep breath and pushes the door open further. He crawls out of his office and starts moving away from the violence. Unfortunately, to get away from the mayhem, he must go deeper into the bowels of Site-22. The exit is the other way, but he is too scared to head towards the armed men. He stands up and brushes the dirt from his blue technician jumpsuit. The lights flicker off. The hallway goes dark. He reaches out his hands and comes into contact with the cool, damp wall. He feels his way down the corridor, swimming in darkness. After a few moments, the lights flicker back on. Pietro looks over his shoulder to make sure he is still in the clear. Standing at the end of the hall is a soldier dressed in all black with a mask covering his face. The soldier stands motionless. Pietro turns to face the soldier. His eyes open wide. His heart races. He can't breathe. The figure doesn't move. Then the lights flicker out again, and Pietro pushes off the wall and runs, blind in the darkness. He sprints as fast as he can when suddenly, there is a loud crack and a bullet whizzes by his head. He can feel the wind as it barely misses his cheek. He continues to run. The lights flicker back on. He peers over his shoulder. Now there is an entire group of armed men pursuing him down the hallway, guns raised. He turns the corner of the hallway and proceeds down a set of stairs further into Site-22. At the bottom of the stairway, there is a short corridor with a door at the end of it. There is nowhere else to go. He pulls a keycard out of his pocket and fumbles it. The card falls to the ground. Pietro bends down to pick it up, and as he leans over, a bullet whizzes past where his head had just been. The projectile embeds itself into the metal door. He scoops his keycard up off the ground and shoves it against the scanner. The door unlocks, and he dashes into the room. He quickly turns and shuts the door. It locks automatically. The last thing he sees is the assassins running towards the door. The lights flicker on in the room where Pietro stands. The room has only one door, no windows and no vents. It is completely isolated. In the middle of the room is SCP-5000. He knew there was an SCP in this room that was designated SCP-5000, but he never knew what it actually was. Here he is now, staring at it. A strange-looking mechanical harness hanging in the middle of the room. Suddenly, loud banging at the door fills the room. The armed men are trying to break in. It is only a matter of time before they pry the door open. With nowhere to go, Pietro Wilson knows that he is dead. He looks at SCP-5000 and shakes his head. What do I have to lose? He says out loud. Only your life. A voice in his head responds. He walks over to SCP-5000 and pulls it down from where it is hanging. It is heavy. On the mechanical suit are symbols he does not recognize. The only thing he knows about the suit are rumors he's heard from others who work at Site-22. Supposedly, it first appeared in a flash of light in the containment chamber of a Keter-level SCP at Site-62C. The designation of this Keter was SCP-579. The only other thing that Pietro knows is that everyone at Site-62C was slaughtered when containment was breached. SCP-5000 was found deactivated next to a pile of bodies. He slips on the harness, and as if it has a life of its own, 
SCP-5000 begins to adjust itself to the exact dimensions of his body. The suit grows and snakes across his skin, wrapping every appendage in armor. Then it begins to tighten. Pietro Wilson starts to scream as SCP-5000 envelops him. The suit rises up the back of his neck and encases his entire head, silencing his screams. The door to the room blasts open from a controlled explosion. As the dust and smoke settles, the masked men enter the room. Their flashlights move from side to side as they search for the elusive technician who had just entered. There is no one in the room. All that is there is an empty rack in the middle of the chamber. The men fan out, but there is no other exit. The room is just a solid square of concrete. They're baffled. Where did he go? One of them shouts. Pietro Wilson had blacked out from the pain of the suit attaching to his body. He comes to, still standing in the middle of the room. All around him are men in black combat gear. They are searching for him. He holds his breath and closes his eyes, but the gunshots never come. He opens one of his eyes and looks around. Why haven't they killed me yet? He thinks. He slowly turns his head as men walk by him with their guns raised. He hears someone say, Where did he go? I'm right here, he thinks. Am I dead? Pietro looks down to see that his entire body is contained within SCP-5000. He lifts his hand and waves it in front of his face. He is still clearly alive, but it seems as if the killers can't see him. He walks up to one of the mercenaries and waves his hand in front of the man's face. There is no reaction. The suit made me invisible, he thinks. Pietro looks at one of the men to see if he can find out who they are and why they have killed everyone at the base. On the sleeve of the man's jacket are the words Zeta-19. He's never heard of Zeta-19 before, but they must be part of an organization that is trying to undermine the SCP Foundation. The men continue to search the empty room, clearly confused as to where the technician went. Pietro weaves his way through the group of men and back out the door he had entered from. On his way through the wreckage that used to be a door, Pietro Wilson trips on some debris. He reaches out to steady himself, but he has fallen. He closes his eyes knowing that as soon as he hits the ground, all of the men hunting him will be alerted by the sound of his fall, but the impact never comes. When Pietro opens his eyes, it is as if he is hovering just above the ground. He looks down at his feet. The toes of the suit are firmly planted on the floor, like powerful magnets on iron. SCP-5000 has prevented his fall and is holding him in place using the feet of the suit only. He reaches out his hand and gently places it on the ground. He pushes himself up to a standing position. He turns to look back into the room. The men are still in there searching for him. Pietro makes his way back through Site-22. He walks by his office and proceeds towards the exit of the facility. As he passes the labs and other rooms at Site-22, all he finds is carnage. Everyone has been killed. An extra bullet has been placed in each person's head to make sure. It seems that the only mission these men were on was to kill everyone and make sure they stay dead. He continues towards the exit of Site-22 that is guarded by two men. As he approaches the two heavily armed men, Pietro makes sure to be as quiet as possible. This is not a difficult task, as the SCP-5000 has given him stealth capabilities. He notices that even his footsteps aren't giving off any sound. It is almost as if the suit is allowing him to glide across the floor. He is almost to the exit, then he will be home free. He takes a deep breath, turns sideways, and squeezes past the two men guarding the doorway. Just as he is about to leave this nightmare behind, one of the guards turns unexpectedly. The man's shoulder runs directly into Pietro Wilson, throwing him off balance. He is knocked into the second guard. Both of the men scream. What is that? One of them shouts. They begin to raise their guns on the invisible object that just bumped into them. It's then that SCP-5000 takes over Pietro's body. The suit raises his arm and grabs one of the men by the throat. With a squeeze, the man's larynx is instantly crushed. Then the suit twists slightly and snaps the man's neck. It turns to face the second man. Even the black mask the man is wearing can't hide the look of terror on his face. But Pietro has no control over what SCP-5000 is doing. He has never killed before. The suit launches Pietro's body into the second man, pinning him against the wall. It then grabs the top of the mercenary's head and slams it against the concrete again and again and again until the man's screams are silenced. The suit lets go of the man and his lifeless body slides to the ground as Pietro backs out. When he regains consciousness, he's outside of Site-22 standing on top of a hill, looking down at the facility below. He looks at his hands, then at the rest of his body. He is still contained within SCP-5000. There is a flash of light, and a heads-up display comes on. He doesn't recognize any of the symbols, but as his eyes move from one area of the screen to the next, the symbols become highlighted. 
Before his eyes, certain symbols began to translate into words he can read. One of the symbols now says, Journal Entry. Unsure of what else to do, Pietro begins recounting what happened to him at Site-22. He makes his way through the desert towards the nearest SCP Foundation safe house. He knows once there, he will be able to reach out to his superiors for help and further orders. Maybe he can even find a way to get SCP-5000 to release him. As he trudges along, Pietro Wilson notices that his brain is telling him he is thirsty, but the vitals on the suit's heads-up display say that he is in good health. In fact, he is better than good. His vitals are all perfect. The suit seems to be giving him all the nutrients mm -hmm. his body needs. It has even fixed his busted knee that was injured back in college playing football. The joint itself has somehow been healed. Pietro finally reaches the safe house and opens the door. It is quiet and dusty. It looks as if no one has been there in years. He walks over to the communication station and tries to contact the Foundation, but all he gets is static. He gives up and walks over to the TV. He pushes the on button. The screen hisses to life. What he sees causes his jaw to drop. SCPs had been let loose around the world and were killing people by the millions. What was going on? Pietro was startled awake from a nightmare. He was hyperventilating, but his body almost immediately recovered and his breathing slowed. A heads-up display flashed on in front of his eyes. Pietro Wilson was still contained within SCP-5000. The suit would not let him go. He instinctively went to rub his eyes, but the metal hands of the suit just clanked against the helmet that covered his head. He wanted out of this suit. Pietro stood up and walked over to the television. He reached out to turn it on, but paused. He thought, do I really want to see how bad things have gotten since I fell asleep? But he had to know. He was filled with dread as the TV came on and he saw the first images. The world looked as if it was ending, and it seemed like the SCP Foundation was responsible. How could this be? They were supposed to protect humanity, not destroy it. Pietro needed to uncover the truth behind what was happening. SCP-5000 had a log entry function that he could use to record everything he uncovered. Even if he didn't make it out of this alive, maybe one day someone would find the suit and be able to access what he had learned. The date of his first journal entry was February 1st, 2020. As Pietro watched the carnage unfold on TV, he began to put together the pieces of what he had witnessed himself. He knew a special ops squad had executed everyone at Site-22 where he worked. He knew that the SCPs had been let loose. He knew the world was ending. But why? As Pietro pondered this, a newscaster appeared. What you have just witnessed are reports from around the world of monsters ravaging cities and towns. This all started with a mysterious message from an organization that calls itself the SCP Foundation. Their ruling body, named the O5 Council, released the following statement. For those who are not currently aware of our existence, we represent the organization known as the SCP Foundation. Our previous mission centered around the containment and study of anomalous objects, entities, and other assorted phenomena. This mission was the focus of our organization for more than 100 years. Due to circumstances outside of our control, this directive has now changed. Our new mission will be the extermination of the human race. There will be no further communication. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. The SCP Foundation had declared war on the human race. How could this be? What had led to the O5 Council changing their entire mission from protecting humanity to ending it? Could it be possible that a powerful SCP had taken control or influenced the Council's decision? Pietro turned on the radio, flipped through TV channels, and scoured the internet for information on what had happened over the past 24 hours. The first image he saw was a human-like creature with arms and legs twice as long as they should have been, with deep black eyes and a mouth curled up into a silent screen, showing teeth as sharp as razor blades. From the files he could access, Pietro learned that this was SCP-096, a creature that was docile until someone saw its face, at which point the SCP would start to shriek and cry before hunting down whoever saw its face and slaughtering them. He quickly changed the channel, the file said that even if SCP-096 was seen on a screen, it would find the viewer and tear them limb from limb. Surely that couldn't be true. There were potentially millions of people who had just seen it on TV. What would happen to them? What would happen to him? On the next channel was footage of a gigantic animal in the middle of the ocean. This was SCP-169, a leviathan from the Precambrian era. The creature was around 5,000 kilometers long and slowly swam just below the surface of the ocean. 
The feed suddenly changed to footage of devastating tsunamis and destruction caused by earthquakes. When SCP-169 had been awoken from its slumber by the Foundation detonating nukes on its back, it began trying to escape the danger. The movement of the massive creature caused natural disasters, destroying coastal communities around the world. On another channel, Pietro was watching as the Chancellor of Germany gave a speech, announcing that the country was declaring war on the SCP Foundation. Off camera, the sound of a tinkling bell could be heard. A man dressed as a Victorian-era butler entered and picked up a pen from the Chancellor's desk. He approached the Chancellor and raised the pen in the air as the camera cut away, but the sound of gunshots and yelling could be heard before the feed went dead. The news reported that similar events involving world leaders by the exact same butler had been occurring since the SCP Foundation changed its mission. Pietro searched through the suit's files to try and figure out what was happening, and found that SCP-662 must have been connected. Next was a strange skin disease plaguing New York and Delhi designated SCP-610 that covered its hosts in rashes and boils before seeking to take over their bodies. Finally, some good news, though. As the outbreak looked to be contained by the combined efforts of the Global Occult Coalition and the Church of the Broken God. And then some bad news, as SCP-682 had also been released. A massive crocodilian monster, its sole mission was to destroy all life. It was fueled by hatred for living things, making it the perfect tool of the O5 Council's new stated mission. Pietro had heard rumors of SCPs that could instantly end the world, but clearly the Foundation hadn't gone down this route. Yet. Did they want to keep the rest of the planet intact? Or maybe there were holdouts in the SCP Foundation who were trying to stop the O5 Council from carrying out their mission? All Pietro knew was that right now, there were some real nasty SCPs running around, wrecking havoc. Pietro suddenly heard an explosion in the distance, far away, but still close enough to make him nervous. Maybe he was better off staying in the safe house and waiting out the apocalypse. The suit was keeping him healthy, nourished, and undetectable to foes. Any sane person would have remained there in seclusion and safety, but Pietro needed answers. He felt it was his responsibility to log and try to make sense of everything the SCP Foundation was doing. He brought up a map of SCP sites in the area on his display. The closest was Site-19. It was time to venture out into the end of the world and find some answers, but he was about to be faced with even more questions. On the way to Site-19, Pietro came across something strange. A squad of Foundation soldiers in a clearing. They were standing at attention as their commander paced back and forth, up and down the line. The soldiers' uniforms had the insignia MTF Epsilon-6 embroidered on them. The commander stopped in front of the first soldier in the line, clapped her hands, and informed the soldier she would be beginning the check now. The commander pulled out a long knife and plunged it into the soldier's shoulder. Strangely, the soldier did not move make a sound, or react in any way. She moved on to the next soldier and repeated the process. This continued on the line until she reached the eighth soldier. This time, when the commander stabbed the shoulder of the soldier, he noticeably winced and cried out in pain. The commander shouted, Got a live one! Pietro watched as the soldiers raised their guns and fired at the one who had cried out. He dropped to the ground. The commander moved on to the last soldier and put the knife in his shoulder. There was no reaction. All right, we're clear, yelled the commander. Let's move out. Pietro waited until the squad was out of sight and made his way to the corpse lying on the ground. He scavenged weapons and basic medical supplies. Then he buried the body and recorded what he had seen in SCP-5000's log. He had no idea why the soldier was killed or why the others didn't feel pain. Maybe they weren't human at all. Maybe it was a squad of SCPs that had a human infiltrate their ranks. None of this makes sense, Pietro thought before continuing on. Upon reaching Site-19, Pietro found it in disarray, and worse, practically all of the SCPs that were held at the site had breached containment. He was able to walk into the compound unnoticed, and deep in the facility he found scientists and researchers going about their business as if they had no idea what was happening out in the world. They must have been following the orders of the O5 Council. Pietro listened in on conversations about how to create the maximum number of human casualties and which SCP should be released next. He felt a deep hatred for the people in the facility. How could they be so casual about wiping out humanity? As he observed more of the workers at Site-19, he noticed something strange. Everyone's eyes were cold and dead, like there was no humanity left in them. 
as if something had got to these scientists and removed the very souls from their bodies. Pietro stealthily stole a senior staff member's credentials and found an empty office where he could access logs from the facility to try to get a better idea of the timeline of events that led to the SCP Foundation's war on humanity. He logged into the mainframe and brought up the entries from the end of the previous year. He found that late in 2019, a project called NUMA became of great interest to the O5 Council. From what Pietro could tell, the project had something to do with the collective human consciousness, also called the psychospace. Apparently, SCP researchers had a breakthrough in mapping out the psychospace. Unfortunately, many of the files had been redacted, and there was no way for Pietro to access the unredacted version. After Numa had been brought to the attention of the O5 Council, a series of orders were sent out to all senior staff and site directors, but frustratingly, these orders had also been redacted. All he could see was that after the orders were sent out, a wave of resignations were submitted across the Foundation. Suspiciously, a wave of suicides had also occurred at roughly the same time. What was in these orders? The O5 Council then sent out a number of files to all senior staff and site directors with instructions to disseminate the materials among those serving under them, after which both the resignations and deaths immediately ceased. Pietro searched everywhere for what was in those files, but like so much of the SCP database, this information had been redacted as well. What was clear was that the SCP Foundation had begun gearing up for the extermination of humanity the following year. The entry log for February 1st, 2020 read, Mobile task forces are dispatched to all exclusionary sites to execute all personnel. Immediately following the conclusion of these missions, the Foundation declares war on humanity. This was where Pietro Wilson's journey had started. He slammed his hands down on the computer monitor in frustration. The suit absorbed all of the impact and crushed the monitor in half. Pietro moved to a new non-smash computer and logged in again. This time he brought up the most current entries to see what the O5 Council was up to recently, to see if there were some answers in the present. The SCP Foundation had been busy while he was making his way to Site-19. They had released SCP-1048 in Paris, which now led a horde of bears down the Champs-Élysées. In the distance, Pietro thought he could almost make out a massive red teddy bear walking between the buildings. The SCP Foundation was also launching counterattacks on any organization that tried to oppose them. They used SCP-1290 to hurl projectiles at the Global Occult Coalition's base. They were also using SCP-1440 to brainwash people and convince them that they needed to riot. This caused widespread destruction as people panicked and were trampled to death. Pietro thought it was sad that such a kind-looking old man could cause so much destruction. He recorded as much as he could before deciding that it was time to get out of Site-19. Although SCP-5000 still made him undetectable, he couldn't shake the feeling that the lifeless eyes of the staff were beginning to look his way more and more often. As Pietro exited Site-19, the sky glowed orange with the fires of countless burning buildings. He needed to find more answers. He needed to uncover the reason the SCP Foundation was trying to wipe out humanity. He had learned a lot from Site-19 and was sure that if he could just get to the next site, he would finally be able to figure out the Foundation's motive, and maybe even how to stop them. He took a step forward, but his heads-up display suddenly went completely dark. The suit constricted tighter around his body, slowing the blood flow to his brain. He couldn't move as his vision got dimmer, and dimmer, and dimmer, until he blacked out. What happened? Pietro says out loud as he looks at his vitals in the heads-up display of SCP-5000. He is still contained within the exclusionary suit that makes him undetectable to human senses. He checks the date and gasps in surprise. Three months? I've been passed out for three months? He stands up and looks across the barren landscape. The screen inside the suit indicates that he has traversed half of the country since he left Site-19 three months ago. Pietro looked down at one of his hands. He is holding a leather briefcase. Where did that come from? He wonders. Pietro has no idea what is inside the briefcase, but he knows it definitely isn't round. He tries to let go. His fingers won't open. He uses his other hand to try and pry the briefcase away from himself, but his hand only clasps to it harder. Then a wave of calm washes over him. Something inside his head speaks to him, but it's not a voice, more like a feeling. It is a sense of purpose, and Pietro's new mission in life is to deliver this briefcase to SCP-579. Nothing else is as important. Pietro Wilson takes a deep breath and embraces his new purpose in life. 
He still wants to uncover the reason that the SCP Foundation is trying to wipe out humanity, but this will have to wait until he delivers the briefcase to SCP-579. Pietro doesn't know exactly where 579 is located, but he can feel a pull in a certain direction, so he begins to walk. Pietro brings up the information stored in the SCP-5000 suit from the Foundation's database. He finds that all information about what SCP-579 is has been expunged from the record. The only useful information in the file is that the Keter-level SCP is located at Site 62C. At least Pietro has a destination to aim for. He travels for days without seeing a living soul, but he does pass thousands of corpses. He tries to ignore them, but one stands out to him inside a house as he searches for supplies. It's the body of a recently deceased boy. He couldn't have been more than eight years old. He was so young, Pietro thinks. He bends over to scoop up the body and bury it outside. As his hand touches the body, the boy's skin begins to move. It is as if hundreds of tiny creatures are scurrying just under the skin. Then from out of every orifice comes hundreds of little pale worms, each with the face of the boy. They are all cackling as they crawl out of the boy's body and into a drain a few feet away. Pietro jumps back and runs. This is the last person I try to bury, he thinks. Pietro pushes forward, the hundreds of little laughing worms haunting his thoughts, until he puts a significant distance between himself and the little boy's body. Pietro continues to walk towards the direction of Site 62C. He passes more corpses, but decides to stay clear of them. Although the suit makes it so Pietro doesn't need to rest, he can only go so fast. He enters a small, abandoned town that looks like something out of an old western movie. A tumbleweed blows across the dirt road. Pietro sits on the wooden step of the local saloon and takes a break. He looks down at the briefcase in his hand. He hasn't had the urge to open it, only to deliver it to SCP-579. Pietro puts the briefcase on his lap. He stares at it and slides his hands along the leather, stops with his thumb on the latch, and pushes. The locks snap open. Pietro opens the briefcase. A bright light beams out, and he passes out. When Pietro comes to again, he is miles closer to Site 62C. There is a warm feeling enveloping his body. He looks down at the briefcase, which is now closed. Wow, this thing is like my own personal skip button, Pietro thinks. He holds up the briefcase, unlatches the locks, sees the bright light, and passes out again. He awakes once again miles away from his last position. So it wasn't just a one-off effect. Pietro continues walking across the country, switching between using his own legs and whatever magic is contained within the briefcase. He is making faster progress now. As he walks through a dense, deciduous forest, he comes across a pack of wolves eating the remains of an SCP agent. Pietro is undetectable to the wolves thanks to the SCP-5000 suit and he makes his way over to the pack, quietly grabbing a laptop laying on the ground next to the agent's body. Pietro takes the laptop and goes away deeper into the forest before stopping to boot up the computer. He has not forgotten about the horrors the SCP Foundation has released, and he needs to know how the world has been doing over the last few months. What he finds is not good. The SCP Foundation has triggered the eruption of Yellowstone, destroying SCP-2000 which, unknown to Pietro, contained the failsafe for rebuilding human society in the event of a world-ending scenario, which this was starting to look more and more like. It was only a matter of time now before the soot and ash thrown up by the eruption blocks out the sun in much of what is left of the United States. The Foundation has also found a way to get SCP-2241 to do their dirty work at refugee camps. The young, brown-haired boy is most likely being manipulated by the Foundation under the pretense that they are only doing what is best for their child. He has caused whole groups of refugees to turn on each other, leading to a massacre. The last entry says that the young boy is being sent to the Global Occult Coalition holdout in Genzir to help destroy some of the last threats to the SCP Foundation. A series of other SCPs have been dispatched by the Foundation around the world to continue the destruction of humanity. They even managed to use temporal anomalies to make it Christmas time everywhere around the world. So SCP-4666, the brutal yuletide creature that stalks the homes of children, is free to cause chaos. Pietro had seen enough. He slams the laptop shut, throws it against the trunk of a tree, 
and opens the briefcase again. He awakes, standing feet away from a group of Global Occult Coalition soldiers who are sitting around a campfire. Maybe they know why the SCP Foundation is trying to end the world, he thinks. He decides that it is too risky to show himself to the soldiers, but takes some solace in sitting around the campfire with other living humans. The soldiers are sharing stories about what is happening. One catches the attention of Pietro Wilson. It is strange, but also may hold a clue as to why the SCP Foundation is trying to wipe out humanity. One of the soldiers recounts an event that he witnessed before leaving the Global Occult Coalition's headquarters at Genzir. They had just captured an SCP soldier trying to break into the base. The infiltrator's name was Samuel Ross. He had been strapped into an interrogation chair and questioned. The interviewers were not getting anywhere until Ross was threatened with torture, to which he responded, Do what you want. Once you realize you're not supposed to feel pain, there's nothing to be afraid of anymore. Pietro sits up straight and starts to listen more intently. He remembers stumbling across SCP soldiers on his way to Site-19 that exhibited the same no-pain mentality that this Samuel Ross seems to have. After that odd statement by Samuel Ross, there was the sound of wind. It started slow at first, then ramped up until it was howling like a hurricane. That's when the screaming started. The screams became louder and climbed to a higher pitch. Then the room went dead silent. The last thing that Samuel Ross said was, Look what you've done to yourselves. I told you you wouldn't like it, didn't you? That's why you hear your voice. But you wanted to know so badly. I really liked you guys, so I was trying to be nice. We're so kind to you, you know. We fight in the light, so you can die in the dark. Hmm, <laughs> disgusting. Pietro sits back on his haunches and rocks back and forth. He has an ominous feeling that there is a connection between the missing pain of the SCP soldiers and the reason why the Foundation declared war on humanity. The soldier who told the story of Samuel Ross stands up. After that interview is when the destruction of Genzir started from the inside. It is why the Global Occult Coalition is no more. God help us all. The soldier finished with his story, turns from the others and starts to walk away. As the soldier makes his way towards the woods, Pietro can just barely make out that he's taken his pistol from its holster before he disappears into the darkness. The world truly has gone mad. Pietro opens the briefcase and blacks out. Pietro sluggishly continues his walk. He's moving down a rocky path in the middle of the forest, and his will to keep going is slowly being drained. The only reason he has not sat down and given up is because of the driving urge to get the briefcase to 579. He wants so badly to concentrate and discover the reason that the Foundation released the SCPs on humanity, but the need to reach 579 won't let him focus on anything else. He's noticed, though, that every time he opens the briefcase to skip ahead, he makes less and less progress. The warm feeling of the first few transports has been replaced by a nauseated headache every time he comes out of the trance. Pietro exits the forest into an open field. The wind blows across the high grass looking like green waves, and standing scattered throughout the field are statues. As Pietro approaches, he sees that they are statues of Mobile Task Force Foundation soldiers. He slowly walks closer to the white marble statues. He reaches the first one and looks at the face of the frozen soldier. His eyes have been scooped out. All that remains are black, empty sockets. The arms of the soldier have been carved into blades, like a praying mantis. He walks past the first statue and proceeds to the next one, where he hears something move in the grass behind him. He spins around to look at the statue. He could have sworn it was in a slightly different position. No, that's crazy, Pietro thinks. He continues to the next statue. It is another carving of an MTF soldier. No eyes, blades for arms. This is really creepy, Pietro says aloud. He proceeds through the field. He walks up a slight hill and turns around to look at the field of statues. What he sees is terrifying. The statues have all moved and are now in different positions. It appears as if they were slashing through the area looking for something or someone. Pietro continues over the hill and comes upon a group of refugees. They are picking through the field looking for food to eat. A fog begins to move in. It is being swept across the meadow by the wind. 
Pietro watches from a distance as the fog envelops the small group. Suddenly there is screaming and the sound of blades going through flesh. The screams cease almost immediately. Pietro runs down the hill to where the refugees were. The fog lifts. The group of people have been cut to pieces. Standing in the middle of the carnage is one of the MTF soldier statues, blood dripping from its blade arms. Pietro knows what to do. He runs. After a few miles, Pietro slows to catch his breath. Those statues must have been created by the Foundation, he thinks. It's as if they are frozen in place. But as soon as you take your eyes off them, they can move with killer speed. Even in the suit, my eyesight can stop them. But they can't see me. They must know I'm there, though, since they can't move. Pietro Wilson opens the briefcase once again, for what he didn't know would be the last time. When he comes to this time, he is near Site 62C. He can feel himself being pulled stronger than ever in the direction of his destination. He walks down a deserted road past the husks of burnt vehicles, and at the end is the gate to Site 62C. There are no guards or security of any kind. It looks like the site has been abandoned for a long time, and the gate is wide open, beckoning Pietro Wilson into Site 62C, where SCP-579 waits. Pietro Wilson enters the dark hallway he somehow knows leads down into the crypt of Site 62C. The walls drip with what he hopes is water from leaking pipes, but it has a metallic smell, and is much too red to actually be water. He begins to feel nauseous. It gets harder to breathe. Even the SCP-5000 suit can't keep him calm. He turns and runs back up the stairs out of Site 62C. Pietro begins to sob uncontrollably as the memories of everything that has happened over the past several months suffocates his will to go on. Then, as if an invisible force that refuses to let him go takes control. Pietro feels as if a gun has been shoved into the small of his back. He is being sent back into Site 62C, whether he wants to go or not. He is unsure if what is forcing him back into the base is inside the briefcase, his own uncontrollable urge to know what is going on, or SCP-579 itself, but he cannot stop himself from re-entering the doorway and proceeding into Site 62C. He doesn't know what SCP-579 looks like, but Pietro has a sinister feeling that it is watching him. He reaches the bottom of the stairway and proceeds down a dark hallway. The power went out a long time ago, and the only light in the depths of Site 62C is the dim glow coming from the helmet of the SCP-5000 suit. Pietro notices long gashes along the concrete walls, as if someone took a giant knife and dragged it from one end of the hallway to the other. There is something at the end of the corridor that Pietro can't make out. As he gets closer, the lights on the SCP-5000 suit begin to flicker. The thing at the end of the hallway seems to move slightly each time the lights on the suit dim. The lights on the suit go out completely, and the entire hallway is plunged into darkness. Only for a second, though, and when the lights come back on, a statue of an MTF soldier looms over Pietro. Its eyes are empty sockets, its lips are turned up in a snarl, the arms have been filed into blades. No! Pietro screams. He dodges around the statue. The moment it is out of his sight, he hears the sound of blades on concrete. As the statue of the soldier comes to life and begins slashing its way down the hallway, it cannot see Pietro, but it knows he is there. It slashes all around, trying to connect with whoever is there with it. Pietro runs to the end of the hallway and reaches the door. He presses against the heavy metal door to open, straining against its weight all while the blind statue is still slashing, coming closer and closer. The door is almost open, but then Pietro feels a blade lacerate the back of the suit cutting deeply into the skin of his back, missing his spinal cord by millimeters. Another blade enters through the back of his shoulder, piercing straight through. He somehow pulls himself through the cracked doorway and kicks the metal door shut behind him. He can hear the banging and scraping of blades outside the metal door. The creature has not given up and is trying to break in. Pietro turns around to see he is in an observation chamber full of instruments and screens. Blood runs down his back from the wounds inflicted by the statue. He walks slowly over to the window. On the desk in front of him is a file labeled SCP-579. He looks through the observation glass and down into the chamber below. It is too dark to make anything out, but Pietro can feel that SCP-579 is down there looking up at him. Pietro looks to his left and sees a hole in the floor. He walks over and looks down. 
and leads right into the containment chamber of 579. Let's get this over with, Pietro says out loud. He holds the briefcase over the hole and tries to open his hand. His finger won't budge. SCP-579 wants him to hand deliver the briefcase. Pietro Wilson takes a deep breath, closes his eyes, and steps into the opening of the hole. He falls. In the moments before he lands in SCP-579's containment chamber, something comes to him. He realizes that he isn't going to be a hero. He isn't going to figure out why the SCP Foundation is trying to wipe out humanity, and he isn't going to survive. He lands hard on the ground below. It is completely dark, except for a shadow that moves in the corner of the containment chamber. Pietro Wilson creates one last log. If anyone ever reads this, please, please figure out why. Explain it to me. Someone. Anyone. I don't get it. I just don't get it. SCP-579 steps into the glow that the SCP-5000 suit is giving off. Pietro Wilson looks up at it. Oh, so that's how it is. He says before SCP-5000 creates its final log. Life signs, lost. Vital signs, lost. SCP-5000 appeared in a flash of light in the containment chamber of SCP-579, located in Site 62C. The researchers monitoring SCP-579 had no idea where the suit came from or why contain the body of Pietro Wilson, a Foundation employee who is assigned to Site-06 and is very much alive. Wilson appears to have no knowledge of SCP-5000, or memories of the events logged in SCP-5000's databanks. Although the suit is believed to have been capable at one point of a number of anomalous functions and abilities, the damage it has sustained has rendered it inoperable, except for the storage of data files, which now have been archived and stored on secure Foundation servers. But is that really the case? The fact is, the tale of Pietro Wilson and SCP-5000 is one of the most complex and mysterious events in the SCP universe. You've got questions, and we've got answers. Why Pietro? What was in the briefcase? What exactly happened at the end of the story? And perhaps most importantly of all, why did the SCP Foundation abandon their mission and make destroying all of humanity their new primary directive? Whenever you're dealing with splintered realities and mind-melting nightmares, there's bound to be a number of interpretations, and we're eager to explain one of the more popular ones right here. Soon you'll know it all, but to find out, we need to start at the beginning. Our hero, Foundation employee Pietro Wilson, was going about his day at Exclusionary Site 06. However, normal operations were interrupted when a mobile task force turned Foundation hit squad stormed in and began executing employees left and right as part of their wider plan to wipe out humanity. Pietro got lucky, though, and managed to find SCP-5000, making him undetectable to the invading MTF squad. This brings us to our first question. Why Pietro? And how does killing Foundation staff help advance the O5 Council's goal of overthrowing humanity? The answer to both questions has everything to do with the site that Pietro and his co-workers were at when the attack went down, Exclusionary Site 06. Exclusionary sites are a very special kind of Foundation site that utilizes the same technology as the Scranton Box, a container used to protect important items from reality warpers, but on a far more ambitious scale. Because of the use of this technology, these exclusionary sites are essentially resistant to CK-class restructuring scenarios and temporal anomalies. Those are where reality and or history itself are changed by a powerful entity. This makes them a perfect location for, say, staff wanting to stage a revolt when their leaders have decided to wipe out humanity. The Foundation wished to eliminate the personnel stationed at these protected sites as a precautionary measure before moving on to the main phase of their plan. But this attack was just one part of the Foundation's wider scheme to purge their ranks of dissenters before putting their final mission into place, in order to make sure there were no internal threats left who could pose a threat to the new main directive. The Foundation murdered all the staff at exclusionary sites, hunted down and assassinated any resigned employees, and killed off any humanoid or human-sympathetic SCPs, leaving no one who could stop them. Or at least, they thought there was no one left. While all of this was happening, Pietro suited up and exited the site. So, why Pietro? 
because he got lucky and he happened to stumble upon SCP-5000. He wasn't the chosen one, nor was he in any way exceptional, beyond his willingness to see his quest for answers through to the bitter end. Pietro really could have been any of us if we were in this situation. When Pietro escaped, he found the world in disarray. SCPs had been released on a global scale, destroying infrastructure, massacring civilians, and assassinating key political figures. The Foundation had even gone public for the first time ever with their new intentions, destroy all humans. Pietro decided to head to Site-19 and get to the bottom of their madness. On his way there, he saw a group of Mobile Task Force members performing a bizarre stabbing ritual to see who among them could feel pain. Remember this, it'd be important later. Like a lot of the small moments in the story of SCP-5000, these are puzzle pieces that can be fit together to create the true picture of what's happening out of the chaos. At Site-19, among the dead-eyed Foundation workers plotting mass killings, Pietro found a treasure trove of vital information. There, he learned about the existence of Project Numa, an O5 Council-approved initiative to map out the human psychosphere, otherwise known as the Collective Unconscious. He also found a redacted unanimous vote from the O5 Council and Ethics Committee, as well as a redacted series of directives sent out to senior staff and site directors, which caused a wave of suicides and resignations. During his search, Pietro also discovered a second series of directives sent out to the remaining site directors and senior staff, including the phrase, Harden Your Heart. These directives are known to some as The Cure. While Pietro didn't have the context to put all this together yet, these are more vital clues to what happened. The NUMA project is what incited the Foundation's motivation to destroy humanity. Killing off humans is actually secondary to eliminating something else that's hiding within the human psychosphere. Again, that's the collective unconsciousness of all humans. The O5 Council and the Ethics Committee were unanimous in their approval of this project, which was like deciding to burn down a house to kill the inhabitants inside. Except in this scenario, humanity is the house. So who or what exactly is the inhabitant? You'll find that out soon. The next thing Pietro knew, he was sitting halfway across the country with no memory of the previous three months. He was also carrying a briefcase with no knowledge of what was inside, except that it was not round. He also had a strange compulsion to deliver the briefcase to SCP-579 for reasons he didn't fully understand, but he hoped that doing so would lead him to some answers. Pietro may not have known what he was holding, but we do. The clue here is not round, which is the only confirmed fact about SCP-055, also known as the Anti-Meme. This is an SCP with the primary anomalous property of literally being unknowable. People who observe it forget what they observed, and have no memory of even looking at 055 in the first place. This is why the briefcase was able to act as Pietro's personal skip button. Pietro was physically covering the distance he traveled, but every time he opened the briefcase and looked at SCP-055, he forgot that period of time, making it seem as though he simply skipped forwards. The thing he was skipping towards, SCP-579, is an equally mysterious and highly dangerous SCP contained within Site-62C. Nobody even really knows what 579 is, only that it's an anomaly so dangerous that the entirety of Site-62C was built to contain it. So what's so important about bringing these two together? That, and the vital importance of Pietro's final mission, will become clear very soon. Pietro continued his journey with the briefcase, encountering more horrors and countless deaths upon the way. He finally found some solace in coming across a group of Global Occult Coalition soldiers, discussing the interrogation of a captured member of Foundation staff named Samuel Ross. Two quotes from Ross's enigmatic speech are of particular interest here. The first, in response to the threat of torture, was, Do what you want. Once you realize you're not supposed to feel pain, there's nothing to be afraid of anymore. The second, after witnessing the death of his captors, was, Look what you've done to yourselves. I told you you wouldn't like it, didn't you? That's why you hear your voice, but you wanted to know so badly. I really liked you guys, so I was trying to be nice. We're so kind to you, you know. We fight in the light, so you can die in the dark. 
disgusting. Do these quotes sound a little familiar? The first because, as Pietro himself recalled, the MTF members getting stabbed earlier also didn't seem to feel pain. The second, because describing people as disgusting is an adjective favored by another infamous SCP, SCP-682. This brings us back to The Cure, the document disseminated by the O5 Council, instructing people to harden their hearts. Whatever the Foundation discovered in the human psychosphere, it's apparently the cause of all pain, and hence, when the Foundation discovered it, they were able to train themselves out of pain. And as for the SCP-682 reference, this is a being that despises life, and it's believed by some that the reason 682 holds this belief is that it's always known about whatever the Foundation recently discovered through Project Numa. Decrypted text logs in the Foundation files confirm this in a document exchange between O5-1 and Tejani, the head of the Foundation Ethics Committee. In their conversation, they confirm the existence of the cure, which deprived the personnel of everything from pain to empathy, being disseminated among staff prior to the massacre, and of the Foundation's sudden ideological alignment with SCP-682. And they found something else too, referred to simply as IT. Whatever IT was, it was the reason Foundation Command decided to wipe out humanity. But what is IT? What could possibly be so bad it was worth killing all of humanity? Perhaps most surprising of all is that Pietro ran into the creature's physical manifestation, and he barely even considered it, due to being occupied by avoiding the attacks of the statue-like mantis arm blinkers. Pietro made an entry in his log, though, describing the strange entity, describing it like a person stretched out, like the space around them was stretched out and they were being stretched along with it. Their body went from the ground up to the clouds and their jaw swung at right angles. There were these gaps as well black gaps in the space around its body, like wings. Foundation staff were fighting it, shooting at this strange entity, but their weapons had no effect. This creature, this it, is a being that inhabits the human psychosphere, meaning it exists within the minds of all humans on some level, driving and manipulating them to mysterious ends. What can it do? What does it want? It seems that the only people who know are the O5 Council, and the Foundation Ethics Committee who were privy to the NUMA report. But whatever it was they saw, they believed it was worth killing off all of humanity just to stop it. As indicated by the unanimous vote from the Ethics Committee, Omnicide was a more ethical choice compared to the alternative. The influence of it was also likely what gave Pietro the strong subconscious desire to unite the briefcase containing SCP-055 with SCP-579 even at the cost of his own life. This brings us to our final question. Why was it so important to unite SCP-055 and SCP-579? And what did this act serve to achieve? As Pietro, wounded by the blinkers and lingering on the edge of death, finally delivered the briefcase into 579's containment chamber, he acknowledged the fact that he was no hero. But that's where Pietro was wrong. After the destruction of SCP-2000, Pietro was in control of one of the only remaining ways to save the world. The combination of the anomalous effects of 055 and 579, as laid out in Rajit's proposal and the article for SCP-2998, is the Foundation's ultimate trump card for preventing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. If the two are united during said scenario, the universe resets to a time before the XK-class scenario began and prevents it from happening. In this case, Pietro united the two, creating a new reality where the NUMA project was never launched, and it was never discovered, thereby adverting the apocalypse. The corpse of poor dead Pietro and the highly damaged SCP-5000 suit he wore were the only evidence that this alternate reality ever existed. This means that the collaboration between Pietro Wilson and the suit he just happened to stumble upon quite literally saved the universe as we know it from a foundation that had gone rogue. In this regard, he's one of the greatest heroes the universe has ever known, even if his actions weren't entirely his own. After all, he got a helping hand from the suit, and another from it, who still lurks in all our minds, mercifully undiscovered to this day. What was its grand plan? or purpose that triggered all the madness. 
Anyone who ever knew for sure resides in a universe that no longer exists, and we can only hope that a history that never happened is somehow unable to repeat itself in ours.